Welcome to the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Brian Russell, and today it's uh, my honor and privilege to have as my guest, A.J. Sherrill. A.J. has more than 20 years of pastoral experience from the beaches of Southern California to the streets of New York City. Uh, currently, uh, he is in Charleston, South Carolina, where he serves as the lead pastor of St. Peter's Church and is in the process of Anglican ordination. He's also an adjunct professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, where he teaches popular courses on preaching and on the Enneagram. Uh, today's conversation, we're going to center on his new book, The Enneagram for Spiritual Formation, How Knowing Ourselves Can Make Us More Like Jesus. AJ is also the author of Expansive and Quiet, and I'll have links to all of his resources in the, in the show notes. Um, AJ, thank you so much uh, for being on my show today. Yeah, man, it's great to meet you and uh, good to talk today. Yeah, and just to jump right in, uh, can you uh, share some of the key moments in your spiritual journey that led you to serving as a pastor and a teacher and also an author? Oh, wow. That's a that's a long story. Uh, I, like many of your listeners, stumbled into ministry accidentally. Uh, my church had a significant need for someone to fill a gap, and it turned into a 20-year journey. Wow. So here I am still. I've tried to get out of ministry, at least full-time ministry in the church, several times, and God keeps saying no. And so it's a joy, though, to serve the church. I, uh, I've been through a, quite a few seasons um, in and out of different traditions within the Orthodox body of Christ around the world. Like I've, I've learned a ton from uh, my Baptist upbringing that I have honor for, even though it wasn't a great theological connect for me long-term. Um, I've been greatly influenced by uh, really rooted charismatics to the contemplative tradition with the Eastern Orthodox. Uh, I've studied Torah with the Jewish rabbis, uh, all the way to leading a non-denominational church uh, in New York City called Trinity Grace and then Mars Hill Bible Church in Grand Rapids. But I've been on the Can Canterbury Trail for probably the last 10 years. I love the idea of um, how the Spirit of God moves along the lines of liturgy. So how do we bring both um, the Holy Spirit and have radical freedom for God to be God in our midst, but at the same time be tethered to uh, the saints and the prayers of those who've come before us that can root us? Um, and so I like the confluence of the traditions of the church coming together and how we can glean from the great tradition for the glory of God and for the good of people. So now that's really good. And, you know, you're, uh, you're, we were talking before we got the program uh, uh, recorded here about uh, your interest in contemplative prayer and your previous books have been on that. And you're also, you said you're writing another book that'll bring in uh, contemplative prayer. Um, how did you find contemplative practices in your spiritual formation, your upbringing? What did they kind of find you? Did you stumble into them? How did that actually come about? Yeah, that's a great question. So I lived in Orlando, such as you do now, uh, growing up. I started a young adult ministry there at a non-denominational church that just sort of exploded. And up until that point, my spirituality had been pretty like success oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're familiar with the word cataphatic, very externally driven, you know, with the senses, and that's all really good. Um, and then I, I decided to move to LA and plant a church because I was too young to sort of manage a big thing. And I realized my character was not in alignment with competency. Mm -hmm. And so I moved there. It totally failed. It got everything. I said, I wanted a hard thing, Lord. And he gave it to me. It like for all intents and purposes, it, you know, along human metrics, it, it just failed. It just, after three years, there was very little to show for it, except for, um, the contemplative sort of moment. I, I was sovereignly connected with a few people in LA that were moving in those streams. And I would spend my Thursdays on Manhattan Beach in Southern California, licking my wounds because people weren't, it wasn't growing like I thought it was, blah, blah, blah. And I had learned that season that I knew how to pray at God and I knew how to pray for things, but I didn't know how to be with God. I didn't know how to quiet my frontal lobe. I didn't know how to be at peace. I didn't know what Henri Nouwen was talking about when he wrote most of his books, specifically that I am what I have, I am what I do, I am what other people say about me. I was so caught up in that world. And so the contemplative tradition was a downshift to a different mode of what it meant to be human. And I sense that if if I didn't learn that, then my spirituality would be stunted because it would always be externally based 
And at best, that leads to pride. And at worst, that leads to despair. And neither of those are a good option when following Jesus. Yeah, that, that's a powerful testimony. And uh, on this podcast, I've shared my own story several times, and that really resonates with that. And, you know, you use the word cataphatic, not everybody's familiar with that technical term, but that's essentially, like you said, image-based, word-based, that's things that's built on scripture. So I think it's always important when we talk about contemplative stuff, because sometimes people get uncomfortable when we're talking about uh, contemplative prayer or Christian meditation, that somehow you're leaving those things behind. But in a sense, that, what I, a sense that you've seen that as an expansion that you're building on a foundation that even in allowing it to even grow taller. Is that, is that how you talk about that with folks or what would you add to, to how does contemplative practices connect with say just um, typical prayer or Bible reading, or even as an Anglican, your work with the uh, book of common prayer? Yeah. I mean, I just want to love about Lexio Divina is so you, you begin yeah. these four beats. You start with the word, you start with allowing the word to wash over you, but where it ends is rest in being. So you That's don't good. have to worry about drifting into the heart of Satan or ending up on some new age spirituality thing because you've started rooted in scripture and you've been able to pray your heart and pray those words. But at the end of the day, you then can trust God and just be. Yes. And we see Jesus over and over leaving the crowds and going into the solitude, going into the wilderness, going into the desert, going up the mountain. And he does that. And you have to think like, let's take the wilderness journey that we celebrate during Lent in the church calendar. You have to think that Jesus eventually ran out of words to say. And so eventually you find yourself just in sheer being with God. And we're not very comfortable with that because we've become so used in Western Protestant spirituality of, um, of needing constant reinforcement in terms of information and words and, you know, the next song and, um, you know, all of these sensations, which are good, but find their end. And where they end is the beginning of what it means to be with God, where words are welcome, but they're not necessary. You know, it's kind of like, looking at the one you love. If you have a spouse after 30 years, I used to look at spouses that were a lot older than me and they weren't saying anything during dinner when we were out. And I'd be like, Oh, how sad. Maybe, but maybe it's beautiful. Maybe for some couples, it's like, Hey, listen, we know each other beyond words and just being in each other's presence is so much sweeter than anything words could offer at this point because we're the beloved to one another. And I think that's a little bit of a glimpse of what God wants with us. Yeah, that, that's a really that's a really powerful uh, illustration. So, um, we'll move into the the enneagram, and, and in a sense, that's connected to contemplative practices. It's also connected to just uh, standard uh, practices that most people would be familiar with. How how did you first become interested or even acquainted to the enneagram? Was it the same period, or could you give some backstory to how you ended up becoming a writer of a book on the enneagram? Yeah, so the, I, you know, like ministry, I stumbled into the enneagram accidentally. Um, I was pastoring a church in New York in Manhattan, a neighborhood called Chelsea, mm -hmm. and I was doing my doctorate at Fuller, yeah. and Richard Rohr had opened up um, like an experimental course where he was trying to teach the living school, what's known as that. It was before that launched, and Fuller wanted Rohr to teach a class on contemplative spirituality, and so I was like, wow, I'll, I'll go study at his house for a week, and so wow. me and a, just a, a little small group of people went, and he started saying something about the Enneagram, and I was like, wait, what? The pentagram? What are you talking about? <laughs> and so he, we got him off task. And for half a day, he just riffed on this theory. And I liked it because, you know, I'd taken the Myers-Briggs, the disc and, you know, the strengths finders, all that stuff, which I think is really good. Um, but nothing got under the thing that gets under the thing that gets under the thing to my motives. So like mm -hmm. I understood my behaviors, but I didn't know what was driving my behavior. And when he started teaching on the Enneagram, it just gave me this universe of language that I had spent my whole life strategizing how to shove under the rug. All of these wounds, all of these strategies, all of this manipulation, all of this stuff. Um, and so there was one type in particular, you know, I said to Richard, I said, you know, how do you know when you find your type? And he said, well, it finds you because you'll read it and you'll be deeply humiliated. So it's the one that brings you the greatest amount of humiliation. And I'm like, cool, who wants to do that? But that's why I think the Enneagram is so powerful for formation because you can name some things and then bring them into the light of Christ yeah. and through spiritual practices and community can seek healing. Um, so it was a very powerful tool for me, but it's just a tool. It's not Jesus. And yes. so I'm very clear about that in all of my, my teachings and writings that I've done for the last probably six years. 
Yeah, in your, in your new book that's out now in 2020, The Enneagram for Spiritual Formation, uh, How Knowing Ourselves Can Make Us More Like Jesus. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you bring out that, that story from, about Richard Rohr about humiliation. And I remember I was, when I was reading the book, I was laughing. I'm like, well, that's an interesting way to find your type. Um, and, and, and I loved it because I, I, you know, deep dive spirituality, it's like I'm, 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 we're all into trying to take a look at what's underneath and I thought, but that, but I'd never actually thought about that. And it made me go back and ponder on my own type. And I thought, does it humiliate me to think that I'm a three um, <laughs> or, or I've already been so humiliated that it was easy just to accept that. I'm like, oh yeah, that's me. So, but that, but that's interesting. Mm-hmm. How, how, what kind of pushback do you get on that? That, I mean, it's, it's such a powerful word. What type humiliates you? Um, and, and, yeah. uh, what, what, what do you think that makes that such a great question? Because um, a lot of people, you know, you just take it, you could take an online assessment or whatever, or you can kind of read through it. But where do you, how does that really help? And have you got any pushback on that from folks? Because I, yeah. I liked it. It was unique about, I had never seen that before. Yeah, I, I was doing a, an Instagram live with my friend Caitlin Beatty a, a few weeks ago, who's a journalist and an author. And I, we were talking about this concept of humiliation. And um, so... I got this question during the chat that I was so glad someone asked it. She was like, why are you encouraging people to seek shame? And it was like, <laughs> oh, wow. It's interesting that we live in a sort of cultural moment where everything yeah. is like a race to the bottom for you're shaming me and you're not, you know what I mean? Um, and humiliation can go a couple of directions. It can go to shame. Yeah. Um, but it can also go to like um, deep um, awareness, um, confession and repentance which means that at the heart, we serve a God that loves us and who already knows these things anyway. And so the humiliation isn't God saying, I'm trying to put you down. The humiliation is saying, is God saying, I'm trying to invite you into reality so that you can face your shadow side. You can face whatever darkness that you've lived in and called home. And that with me, we can walk into something new and something beautiful. So, um, you know, I think that's a quick conversation of sort of helping people tweak that the idea of humiliation need not necessarily lead us to shame that's kind of chronic and we stay there. It can also lead us to a sense of awareness and confession that can really lead us to paths of renewal. It's like, it's like this. If I had food on my mouth, I would want you to tell me, right? It wouldn't be shaming for you, Dr. Russell, to be like, hey, AJ, you got some spaghetti sitting on the side of your cheek. I just want you to know before you leave this lunch and walk into that next meeting, I'd be like, thank you so much. And that's kind of what's happening in our enneotype is God is just revealing the things we cannot see in a way that once we see them, we can't unsee them. And that the invitation is then to see them transformed. No, that was, that was fantastic. And so thanks for, uh, for a couple of the clarifying, even expand on that. Cause I think that's, um, uh, that's so good because I know, again, this isn't about me. This is about how, highlight in your book. But I know when I first took the Enneagram, sometimes I slide between um, like five or three or a one. Um, usually three is up there at the top, but sometimes it'll tie. But you know, but I, I read the three and I'm like, uh, yeah, that, 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 that's me. That's me. I'm the guy mm-hmm. that has to crank all the stuff out. And and then, you know, then, then you read the, the flip of that is that uh, you can be um, deceiving and you think, I always thought I was being missional, being all things to all people, but in yeah. fact, maybe there's just a little core wound in there. And so that, you know, that, that so I, that really resonated it, you know, and I found, um, I found it actually freeing because it's like, you know, at some level, if you want to be free, you have to actually be yourself and then recognize that astonishingly God loves you. Um, and yeah. then as you just said, it's an invitation, not about, uh, about a shaming thing. So I thought that was really, that was really good. So thank you for, uh, for, for sharing that. You've, you also um, mentioned um, some of these other tests that are available. I mean, you already, and I think you already talked a little bit about DISC and Myers-Briggs and Strength Finders. These are all great tools. And you talk about the Enneagram as a tool. Why do you think um, right now that the Enneagram is so, um, it seems like it's so popular because I, I, I first, I didn't mention this before we got on. I, I first ran in the Enneagram, um, Dr. Oz from TV, the Oprah show, his wife wrote a book that my wife read, I'm going to say 2013, 2014. And, and after I saw the Enneagram, I'm like, wait a second, that's what was in this book. And I didn't even know it. So it popped up there. But then the last three or four years, students in class are coming in like, hey, Dr. Russell, what, what Enneagram type are you? I'm like, I don't know. 
and so it kind of got me into it. And then my own coach had me take it. And, you know, and I, I just, and there's a lot, and you go look and there's lots of books. So what do you think it is about this moment? And it's not just Christian people. Cause I mean, like Dr. Oz show had this thing on there. So what is it about the Enneagram that it seems like it, maybe it's the tool for our day. Do you have any thoughts yeah. about that? Yeah, I think let's look at it in terms of a cocktail. I think it's two parts, equal parts, narcissism <laughs> with uh, uh, self-awareness. I think people, want to know more about themselves yeah. and and that can that can be a little narcissistic if we're not careful that's why i think the enneagram is always a means and never an end yeah um and meaning that it's a it's a movement toward formation um but i i think two people are like want to be deeply self-aware i mean especially with what we find ourselves in this cultural moment with racism mm -hmm. I, I think this generation is is willing to say hey listen if we've got some sins of our past uh, we need to figure out how, what those mean for the world and own what we need to own. So I think there's more of a um, authenticity, a desire to know thyself. Um, and again, if we're not careful, that can lead us into all sorts of nefarious individualistic sorts of things. But it, it also can lead us to a sense of community and a sense of, of growth. So I think people are up for that more than ever before. And talk a little bit about it now from a Christian perspective. I mean, your whole book is about how to use it for spiritual formation, but how, how do you sense as a pastor, and I mean, you've been pastor in, in different parts of the country. I mean, Mich Grand Rapids is a lot different than New York mm -hmm. City or uh, LA, or now you're down in Charleston, a historic Southern city, and, you've been, and you were pastor in Orlando. And I even, you know, we figured out that I was even at the church in Orlando uh, at a conference when you were actually a youth pastor, which is really cool. But um, you've been a lot of different places. Um, so how, how, how do you sense that the Enneagram is really positioned to help Christian, well, anybody, but you know, let's just say Christians um, grow deeper spiritually. What what make what sets it apart and makes it uh, uniquely maybe helpful uh, for that? Yeah, it names that which we want to keep hidden, mm. and when you what you can only transform what you can name. That's good. And we spend a lot of our time subconsciously uh, seeking ignorance or being okay, making peace with it, because if we don't name it, then maybe we don't have to face it. And so that's where the humiliation comes in is you feel mm. like you've been had, you feel like you've been caught. And so that's not neutral. That's a, oh my goodness, someone just read my journal and they're articulating for me and giving me a lexicon that I, I did not previously have. There, there's a, there's a, uh, evaporate, no, it was, um, uh, 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 oh, what's his name from the seventh, 16th, 17th century. Um, this is where my, my uh, my mind is beginning to find holes and not be able to connect those neural pathways. Yeah, Desiderius Erasmus is who it is. Desiderius Erasmus, oh, the, Erasmus. the humanist. Yes. Okay, that makes sense. In any case, uh, he talks about um, thinking about this idea of word, and that it's it's that it's he retranslates John one as conversation. That in the beginning was the conversation, and the mm -hmm. conversation was with God, and the conversation was God. In other words that the Trinity has always been in this conversation and that words have meaning, that words create worlds. And it's possible that through the conversation that you and I were created. And I think that what that means for us is once we can find words to articulate things, we can begin to name realities that we can either see as beautiful or see as broken and we can move into seeing them restored. So words really matter. And the Enneagram gives people a universe of new words about their own life that helps them then take responsibility for their future. And I think that's really important for today. Oh, that's, that's, that is, that is really good. Yeah. I'm gonna have to look up. That's a good quote. I wasn't sure. I'm not sure who you're speaking about from the 16th or 17th century, but that's, um, that was, that was really, that was really helpful. And, and so you connected specifically to, to discipleship. And one of the things I liked about, um, your, your, your book is that it wasn't cookie cutter and not that any spiritual formation teacher is cookie cutter, but a lot of times we get into that, um, it's easy in the church to be, to do the old um, cliche. All you have is a hammer. Every problem has to be a nail basically. Right. And so you, you, you have the, you know, the opposite, you, you basically give an array of different options depending on type. And, and so you use the Enneagram for that. So what helped you in that insight uh, to sense that, um, there wasn't just a cookie cutter approach to discipleship, which is, you know, like you should read the Bible more, you should pray more, you should go to church more, that kind of a thing. Um, what, what, what kind of led you to that insight and how did the Enneagram actually help you with that? Yeah, it's easy. So if you're in a pastoral context, it's easy to look out into a church and to batch spiritual formation, right? Yeah. So read your Bible, come to church, give some money and in 30 years, you'll be 
different. Most people after 30 years don't feel different. They just feel older. And I started asking questions about my own pastoral ministry of like, am I helping people create, take responsibility for and create their spiritual pathway that maybe it's more nuanced and has to do with personality? Um, Maybe we need to be thinking, first of all, you can't just read the Bible one way. There's so many ways that the great Christian tradition has given us to read the Bible. Inductive Bible study, 365 days, Lexia Divina. I mean, take your pick. There's so many ways to interpret. Uh, for the Jewish people, it's Pardis. There's all these different layers like an onion to understanding the scriptural sort of way of encountering the text. Um, same thing with prayer. There's contemplative prayer. There's prophetic prayer. There's intercessory prayer. There's, you know, breath prayer. There's so many different ways to pray. So I began to ask myself, maybe that has something to do with how God made our personalities unique. Mm -hmm. And what would it look like to help the different personalities connect with uh, a sort of uh, authentic pathway that you can sort of create in order to have a life with God and have a meaningful sort of way of being in the world. So how do we help people, you know, as a pastor, my job isn't to give people three things that's going to help everybody all the time. It's to say, how do I enable and equip you to understand the great Christian, tr Christian tradition and how the people before us have connected with God in different pathways, same God, but very different pathways that can help sort of shape us into Christ likeness. Now, the critique at that point becomes, well, you know, of course, you're just going to pick the things that sort of go along with your personality that you like. But that's where the beauty comes in, is you have what's called in the book downstream practices. Mm -hmm. So imagine yourself sitting in a lazy river. Your downstream practices are when you get in that river, if you're in a raft, they just carry you naturally. Those are practices that you would naturally tend toward. Those are good. We want to affirm those. But there are also upstream practices. Those are practices that are probably going to fight against the current of the way in which you want to roll, but they actually have something to give you and impart to you that you wouldn't necessarily choose on your own. So for me as an Enneagram 3, I would not necessarily choose the contemplative tradition of being with God. What made me come to a place in my life where I needed a better praying life that could be with God and not just talk at God was failure, yeah. was humiliation, was a failed church plant. And I realized I don't really have a meaningful life with God. I only know how to get stuff from God. And that's a, like a problem if I'm going to sustain my faith long term. So every single personality type has an upstream and downstream practice, at least one, if not many. And so my goal is by the end of my workshops is for you to leave having created your own rule of life, that you have the sort of understanding of how I'm going to meaningfully engage with God in the course of my life or in this next season or whatever that might be. So that, that's where a lot of it came out of self-critique is perhaps as a pastor, I need to do a better job of equipping the church to understand how they might seek the presence of God uh, in the various pathways, pathways that we have. And maybe that has something to do with our personalities. And I think that's in this whole upstream downstream, I, th I think that's a profoundly helpful uh, insight. I, I, you know, I, I read when I, re I read the book and I, you know, and I didn't, your answer was, I probably missed when I misread it. Cause I was thinking like, okay, this is interesting, but now when you said it, it really resonates. Cause a lot of times we think that um, spiritual formation, we're supposed to like, you know, customize the rule of life. So it fits us uniquely, but in a sense, the, the upstream piece is the challenge that comes in. And uh, what, what do you think, brings a person like some of us naturally you know we like to go to the point of no, of least resistance so the downstream ends up being sweet spot right now you missed a you mentioned crisis and you know and i, I told joe when we're off off camera a little bit i mean i i crashed into um centering prayer essentially post-divorce when i literally thought i was going crazy this is on a episode eight if anybody wants to hear the full story on this but but like my brain was going crazy and so i'm like I got to do something. So I, I learned how to do centering prayer. And I remember how hard it was just to sit mm -hmm. still because it went against everything that I am. I think all the time it's been my job, but that would basically was upstream. But now, you know, in a sense, it's kind of interesting. I'd like to hear your opinion on this too. And, th and now you, cause you just got me excited by your answer. So like now centering prayer is like, I do it every single day for at least 20 minutes. It's just my, it's my rule of life. I've been locked in and, and, and on tough days, I'll even do it longer of, um, you know, an hour, not, not, a, I'll do multiple sessions is what mm. I end up doing. And it's just like, I can't imagine my life without it. So like if, if you were coaching me right now on rule of life and essentially centering prayers now that been, um, is now downstream for me. Right. Um, mm. cause it's easy and I, I love it. 
is this a process on through life? And so like, what, what would I need to be thinking about if I wanted to challenge myself again? I mean, again, this is a, wasn't on the list of questions I sent you, but I think this, this yeah. is an interesting question. Have you thought about that? Like I mean, maybe even reflect on yourself. How do you challenge yourself and somebody listening and think, okay, I got this rule of life that works. Um, how do you put a little edge on that? So it just doesn't become old hat over time. Totally. So imagine your life like a spiraling circle, right? Yeah. Going upward. I want to be careful about that because I don't mean to suggest that, um, well, I think you know what I mean. Like, I yeah, don't mean to yeah. just suggest arrival. What right, I mean right. to suggest is that um, some sort of progress on a sort of ascendancy toward more holism, more, more shalom. And I like to think about there are circles on that pathway. There are at least six of them, and they're called directions. Mm -hmm. So there's the inward life, which you just talked about. There's the upward life of praise and worship. There's, there's the, the backward life of study and understanding those who've come before us, church history. There is the forward life of charismatic practice and seeking the gifts of the spirit. There is the withward life of community. And then there is the, um, the outward life of mission and justice. What happens is, so imagine those as vectors or directions for following Jesus. What happens is we typically circle the ones we're good at. Like I'm really good at inward, like you're saying you are, and I'm really good at upward. And we forget, oh, wait, 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 there's this outward life of justice that if I'm going to live a Shema spirituality of integrating the fullness of God into my life, I need to take seriously what it means to love and serve God in righteousness and justice. Sometimes we omit the withward where it's just inner life, we're good at worshiping, we're not good at community and vulnerability and hospitality. So there are these six directions in a book I, I wrote called Expansive. And it basically keeps me honest because there's seasons where I check in. Like right now, I took a new church recently. And so this sort of direction of outward is lacking in my life because everything is about sort of um, integrating into this new community. And that's okay for a season. I, I, I want to be careful that I don't mean to suggest you need to be doing everything right now all but there are ways that we can challenge ourselves yeah. to think about all the directions we can go to following Jesus. And we need to check in with those directions because I know in the next six to 12 months, if I haven't checked in with an outward sort of disposition of how my life needs to move now towards serving the poor and the marginalized, if I'm only trying to serve the really like, you know, middle-class people in my church without thinking about the underprivileged and those who don't have equal opportunity, then I'm going to have a sort of lopsided spirituality. And so that's what I would say to your question of like, hey, if I feel like I'm getting really sort of uh, adjusted to this direction of the inner life, of the contemplative life, well, then you look at those other directions and yeah. you say, am I in deep community? Am I living a withward life? Do, do I know about, you know, do I read? Am I living a sort of backward life of understanding who's come before me and what they have to, to sort of contribute to my life? Um, and so there are different ways we can think about following Jesus that I think challenge us at different seasons of our life. Now that, that but within really those, good. there's practices within each of those. That's, that's really good. And, that, and that's in your book, Expan Expansive. And that was a, a, a previous book to the one in, in Neagram. So that's, uh, that's exciting. I think that's a great model. I was just talking to a, another friend of mine when we were talking about rule of life. And he used the model of a skyscraper that basically you've got your rule of life has to expand underneath you need a deeper foundation, the taller you want your building to go. And if yeah. we, you know, you know, you're, you're in the Anglican tradition and. Uh, well, and know. here's how, here's how Nowen talks about it. So like, yeah. let's just say for your listeners or for you, like take your spiritual prep, your rule of life that you're doing right now and write yeah. out what you're doing. And then what you do is you create um, an X and Y axis. And it's like the categories are solitude, community, ministry. That's good. Those are Henry Nowen's. And what I like to do is take, okay, what practices am I doing? And are they all solitude? Are they all community? Are they all ministry? Yeah. Am I living a sort of balanced spirituality where over the course of time, all three of those are happening? I have practices that root me toward solitude. I have practices that root me in community. I have practices that root me toward ministry and justice. That's good. And that's the sort of balance, holistic Shema spirituality that I think God wants for us. That's helpful. And I, and I liked, I appreciated, uh, the, you know, the structure of, of your book, uh, that you walk through, um, identity, personality, discipleship structure, then evangelism, which really could be mission. And I want to talk about that, that evangelism chapter just for a second. 
because it touches on something that you just said. Um, you, you connect our Enneagram type, and I use the, phrase, use the word holding or holdings, I think, um, as, a, as a signal for how we can show up in the world and get involved outwardly. Could you, you talk a little bit about that? Because sometimes when you think Enneagram, you, you, you said one of the dangers is narcissism, but in a sense, you have a chapter that pushes us outside of ourselves immediately. So how does the Enneagram help us to maybe understand how we can engage uh, the world around us in, in ministry or evangelism or mission or justice? All those words fit together in that chapter, I think. Yeah, when each of our type, each of the nine types, when they become aware that the world is not whole, first of all, it's raining. Do you want me to go inside? Can you hear this outside? I can hear the, it's starting to, I can start to hear the rain a little bit, I guess. Let me go inside. Not, yeah, we'll just have a pause here. What A.H. Okay. Almas wants to talk about in, in his, he's a Kuwaiti spiritualist, not a Christian, but he made a contribution that I felt like, oh my goodness, I can leverage that for the Christian story. He talks about um, what he calls our holdings. And what he means by that is that every personality, I'm now in my daughter's room. So if you see some, you know, books for second graders and some stuffed animals, give me some grace here. Yeah, um, that's okay. <laughs> I have a seven-year-old. She's my life. She's amazing. Praise um, the Lord. So holdings are basically what we do mm -hmm. to fill the gap of the world that we long for and the world that we have. So we constantly in our flesh want to actually repair and renew the world on our own because we've recognized our own brokenness. And so we seek to sort of repair the world in our own strength. Good. And for me, I think that's very interesting, first of all, because it shows our proclivity to try to renew the world without God. Um, but it also showcases the reality that we live in a broken and fallen world. Mm. And what's helpful about that, so like each of the types I give like examples from A.H. Almas of like ways that we're trying to hold the world on our own, right? Because we each have different ways of doing that. Um, what I like about that is it, it changes the water cooler conversation, the mm -hmm. conversation with your neighbor who doesn't want to talk about sin, who doesn't want to talk about, you know, the need for justification. I mean, you bring that to your neighbor as a first convo, that'll be your last time you ever talk to that guy. But there are ways in which I think the Enneagram opens up new language. Again, it comes back to new lexicons, new language, which opens up new worlds. People, as they're becoming more and more um, aware of the Enneagram, whether they're believers or not, are becoming more honest about brokenness, Yes. which in our tradition is called sin. I mean, sin is the gap between the way the world is and, and what it should be. And how do we repair that gap? Obviously, we in the Christian tradition have you know, a clear articulation about what the cross and resurrection means for that. Um, but it's a, it's a better way of starting conversations with people. The Enneagram gets at human brokenness really quickly. And so you can get beyond talking about college football and the weather or whatever, and you can more quickly engage people about the depths of life of ways that, you know, you're, you're succeeding in this world, but also ways that you're super broken. And so I think the Enneagram is actually a really great starter tool for evangelism for those that want to bridge, you know, build bridges with people, recognize the reality that um, we're broken and want to have a conversation with our neighbors over the course of time is what should we do about that? No, that's fantastic. And again, your, your new book is, is, uh, is called uh, Enneagram for Spiritual Formation, How Knowing Ourselves Can Make Us More Like Jesus. Uh, I want to ask you a couple final questions, AJ, and thanks so much for the generosity of your, of your time today. Um, and these are the questions I like to ask everybody that's on the show here. Um, when you look at your life, and again, you've been, uh, I can really tell you're real deep and uh, been very transparent even today. And in your book, you share some great stories. But when you look back over your life, and you, if you had to pick two to three books that, that truly shaped you deep, you know, your, you, you deeply, um, other than the Bible, um, what, what would be some of those books or maybe the authors? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd say the collection of Henri Nouwen as a three has been so helpful for me. I mean, someone who was at the top of his game at Harvard and Yale and left to minister to uh, the, the handicapped because he knew they had something to contribute to his life. So anything by Henri now, and I'd say read his whole collection. Um, the Genesee diary was really helpful for me of his. Oh, okay. It's his own sort of inner working of working out the contemplative life while at a monastery, how hard that is. And then um, I, I have, I am finding right now that we need more church history than ever. Mm -hmm. Like even in this pandemic moment, people don't realize the plague of Galen 
People don't understand the bubonic plague. People don't understand, obviously, the, the, the influenza, the Spanish flu. It situates us in a context that we've been here before, and the church has not just survived, but thrived in these moments of, of love. And so like Robert Louis Wilkin is a really deep well for me of the first thousand years. I think every Christian needs to read more church history to understand that we stand on the shoulders of those who've come before us. And Robert Sitzer, Water from a Deep Well, that's always the first church history book I give people because he puts, he puts the Christian tradition in like 10 different sort of chapters. It's so beautiful. There's a chapter on mission. There's one on monasticism. There's one on, you know, all the Reformation, all these different sort of pivots that the church has made throughout time. And it gives us a wider script. Most people are falling away from their script right now because it's just their evangelical paradigm isn't deep enough for them. And they've realized in moments like this of isolation, of uncertainty, of political chaos and social outrage, they don't, they haven't cultivated a faith that takes them deep enough into um, of the broken world. And so when their middle-class lives are, are fractured, they don't know what to do. And so cynicism rises up and you leave the church and you do your own thing. And that's a really sad reality for a lot of Christians today. No, that's good. And I mean, even, um, you know, even when I think of my own story, it's like, um, you know, centering prayer, contemplative practices. I, I mean, I grew up at the, I grew up in the church from age five um, and even seminary professor and I don't really know a lot about the contemplative stuff and then it finds me I'm like wow and this stuff goes all the way back to the beginning and so little if that, that's true for a seminary professor that's true for so many of us and so thanks for reminding us about that that deep well and you know whenever you think geez I'm unique nothing like this has ever happened um, that, that's that's just the story we tell ourselves uh, and, and, and we have this the cloud of witnesses that were uh, that, that whose shoulders we can stand on that again not doesn't doesn't mean culture doesn't change and there's more technology and stuff now, but the same, we're still, we're still the same people that we're living in the, even in the iron age, essentially in terms of DNA and stuff. And so thanks for that great reminder. I don't yes. hear people say and read church history. That's a great reminder. So thank you, AJ. Um, what about your own rhythm of life? You've hinted at this a little bit in, um, uh, in, in our conversation, but I always like to ask um, each of my guests, um, you know, what really grounds you, um, you know, you can be as, um, specific as you want to, but what are kind of your, your foundational practices that, that keeps, allows you to be who God created you to be, at least during this season? Yeah. So I have a future orientation toward life and I always want to achieve. That's part of my Enneagram sort of personality. Yeah. So reaching for the email as my first thing of the day or social media is a real significant temptation. And, you know, a lot of people say that tongue in cheek. No, I, I like really mean it. That's like a that's like a bad way to start my day because I can be knee deep in work and meritocracy before you know it. So I start without the phone. Um, practices have as much to do with what you're not doing as much as what you are. That's good. So there's some no's that I, I have to, to do, not like arbitrarily or religiously, but because I want the presence of God and I want to receive my belovedness. So every morning uh, I make my French press because that is a yes. Uh, my coffee is a yes and it needs to be good coffee. And uh, I'll sit down and uh, I read the daily office. So I'll start with um, the saying the Apostles' Creed, mm-hmm. which every Christian should just memorize and have it in their heart. I just say that because that's my story. That's where I pledge my allegiance. I don't pledge my allegiance to a nation. Uh, I pledge my allegiance to the creed. The creed is my bedrock of identity. So I say that every morning, and then I read the four scriptures for the daily office, which are just the four readings of the day in the Anglican tradition. And... Um, and then after those readings, I do a contemplative sit for, you know, five, seven, 10, 12 minutes. And again, everything moves me toward being. So I start with reading and prayer, and then I move toward being. So doing to being is, is, is always sort of the, the movement. And what happens is after doing and you being, you move back into doing as you move mm-hmm. into the world. So yeah, that's my morning routine um, of what I do when I first get up. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for, thank you for sharing uh, that. And now, you know, where can listeners uh, find you? If like if they've listened to this, I know you do some Enneagram workshops. So if, if folks want to follow you on social media or, or find some, uh, maybe a website, what are the best places that folks can find? And I'll have all these listed out in the show notes for, uh, for listeners too. So. Yeah. AJSherrill.org is a website. Um, you can contact me. Uh, Twitter is just AJ Sherrill. And uh, Instagram's AJ underscore Cheryl. I don't know who took AJ Cheryl, but somebody did on Instagram. So God bless them. <laughs> um, and I, I pastor St. Peter's Church here in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. So if you're ever in town, come visit, come say hey, and uh, let's worship together. 
Yeah, and I will say on your Instagram, I really like you put some good content. You've had some wonderful in Enneagram videos here talking about how to navigate this. Um, we're, in a, we're in an election cycle, if any folks haven't mm -hmm. noticed, and you have some really cool conversations with different Enneagram types on there. So that's a, that's, you have, that's a really good Instagram account if people are looking for good quality content that's uh, gospel-centered and actually helpful. So you know, cool. thanks for your presence online, and thanks for your, your service in the church. And uh, you know, as we were talking, my guest, I think episode three or four was Alex May McManus. And it's really because of AJ I found out that I actually met Alex because it was under his leadership that he brought um, Alex and his brother Irwin to Orlando back in 20 or 2005. And uh, so I actually have to thank you for uh, that leadership back when you were, I guess, in your 20s, I'm going to guess. So that was one of those life changing moments for me. So I felt like we, we were actually connected and I owe you a debt of gratitude beyond all the people that, that, that you've served over the years. So thank you for your ministry. Great, man. Well, it's great to meet you. I'm for Asbury and uh, grateful for the work that you do in the world. Well, thank you. And folks, thanks for listening. And until next time, live by faith, be known by love, and be voices of hope in a world that desperately needs it. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast. It's a real privilege to serve you through this medium. I'd love to have feedback. If you have questions or if you have ideas for guests or topics that you'd like me to cover, feel free to email me, deepdivespirituality at gmail.com. Also, I'd be truly grateful if you would share my podcast with your friends and network, and if you could leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you're actually listening to this material. Until next time, be a blessing to someone today.